So it, what, what that's done in reality is uh, the combination of social media and uh, some sort of linguistic change and the law in terms of the criminality and recognition of coercive control has sort of opened up the area for, for, for lawyers. And there's something particularly intense about uh, intimate personal relationships when it comes to when they go wrong and then how people seek to define the problems. They want the court to recognize, to give a diagnostic of the other person, like they are a narcissist. And I've seen that backfire. But the reality is when you're in court, the threshold for behavior is very high. And the leading cases on behavior tend to look at things like attempted murder. Yeah, that's the level we're looking at. It's often termed as a very yeah. high bar. Now, judges, therefore, don't really like um behavior being casually argued if it's below that threshold then it's not relevant if it's if you want to plead it you have to you have to argue it at that point but for that there is another category which is more relevant actually so people do make a mistake there and if they do then it will backfire on them but where it is relevant or more relevant is in sort of financial control yeah so, so what you'll notice from that is what the court are dealing with or prefer to deal with is measurables if you like, so financial stuff is measurable and you know, you can then assess it. Yeah. The, the, where I think, in my experience at least, where the psychological aspect of it comes in is more in case management and client management. You know, if you listen carefully you know, to, your, to your clients, then, then you pick up actually where there is a potentially a serious problem with the other person's approach. And that's going to inform how you litigate. You know, I mean, for instance, if you had somebody who, who really did have uh, a diagnosis or a, a potential diagnosis of um, uh, narcissistic personality disorder, you know, as of DSM-5, yes. in other words, that they scored five, at least five out of nine of the, the, the key points in the DSM, then, of course, you'd be yourself mad to litigate in... Uh, in a friendly open. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to the podcast. Today, I'm really happy to have with us uh, a guest, Henry Crisp, who is a lawyer and mediator based in the United Kingdom, who's got experience in dealing with narcissists, toxic people, and divorce law. And I know that quite a few of our listeners are either stuck in a toxic relationship, sometimes married, sometimes with children. Other times they're trying to get out. Other times they are out and they have to deal with toxic people. And I know that Henry will be able to share with us uh, a lot of anecdotes and knowledge and tips and tricks and things to avoid. So I'm very happy to have you on the show. Welcome, Henry. Thank you very much, Fred. I'm delighted to be here. Very good to have you. And uh, before we get started, I'd like to, I'm curious, how come that a lawyer would be dealing with narcissists and divorce law? There must be some kind of story behind this. Well, actually, um, it's something that you come across now all the time. It's very interesting because I've been uh, practicing for about 30 years. And the environment has changed so much, but we're over the last sort of five years in particular, Fred, you see um, people importing kind of uh, social media style uh, language into the uh, uh, theater of divorce. So narcissism uh, has become uh, introduced as a, as, a, as, a, as a subject, often used as a description. Uh, casually um, to depict uh, characteristics of the other party. Um, you know, we also now have law on coercive control. So we've had to look actually and move more into that territory when we're assessing cases because it now has, of course, a, a criminal connotation, whereas before mm -hmm. it was casual. So it, what, what that's done in reality is uh, the combination of social media and uh, some sort of linguistic change and the law in terms of the criminality and recognition of coercive control has sort of opened up the area for, for, for lawyers. Now, I have to say, in terms of my specialism, which is sort of uh, family law, it's, it's generally a more casual uh, association with the language. And that's, I think that's quite interesting because uh, you, you, you have to be very careful. And I noticed actually in one of the... Um, podcast for Fred that you did. I, I was listening to it. I thought you were very careful uh, in terms of your use of terms, which I think is really important because that you get these linguistic cages and you get these narratives that uh, quickly develop and become 
quite difficult to escape. Uh, I'm involving conflict resolution, not necessarily mediation or collaboration. Sometimes it's a straight fight, as you might put it, in the courts. Mm -hmm. Nonetheless, you know, you have to be uh, you have to be open minded in terms of your categorization. We come across narcissists. I mean, let's make no bones about it. Uh, we do come across uh, narcissists. We also come across a lot of people who have some traits that are perhaps uh, triggered by the process. Um, mm -hmm. You get that sort of uh, quantum complication, don't you, where people get into a relationship and they trigger each other in various different ways and they sort of oh, yeah. up aspects of, of, of each other that perhaps they didn't um, anticipate or recognise when they first got into the relationship. And there's something particularly intense about uh, intimate personal relationships when it comes to when they go wrong and then how people seek to define the problems. So yeah, all of that yeah. sort of comes up. Yeah, I can, I can imagine that. I can, I can also imagine, and I've seen it, I've seen it happen a few times where one party is sort of, how should I put it? It's like they, they get muddled up in their objectives. So one objective ought to be to get the best outcome possible, you know, a fair outcome and the best outcome possible, and sometimes mm. get muddled up. And it's like, they want the court to recognize, to give a diagnostic of the other person, like they are a narcissist. And I've seen that backfire where the court basically says, it's not a, we're, we're not psychologists, we're not therapists. We're not here to do this kind of thing. We're here to give a fair outcome for both parties and the children of children are involved. Have you yeah. seen something like this uh, sort of get sidetracked where people get, yeah. get too focused on trying to get a diagnostic as opposed to staying strategic? Yeah. Okay. So that's a really, uh, that's a really good point. So in the pleadings, particularly if you're in uh, court, the court process, the pleadings, uh, the disclosure pleadings are front loaded uh, because the process of late is to try and promote settlement. So what, that so means what, what do you mean by front loaded? It means that you do it early in the process. So okay. you've got this sort of three-stage process in, in court. The first stage is really information gathering, disclosure. Okay. The second stage is sort of negotiation, if you like, leading to a sort of court-based type of arbitration. Mm -hmm. And the third is trial. If everything else fails, it'll go to a judge who will simply make a decision irrespective of what the parties want. Okay. So the, the process is front loaded in terms of the fact that the uh, disclosure documents, the cases, each party makes out their case at the beginning in that first third. Mm -hmm. And uh, in order to streamline it, they have a particular formula. A lot of your uh, listeners will, who are going through this will be uh, familiar with the Form E, Financial Statement Form. Okay. And um, this is where it first pops up because there is a uh, that that form is divided uh, into different categories, really, you know, sort of basic uh, valuations, bank accounts, all the things you'd expect, but also includes a section which enables you to make out a positional case. And in that, of course, you find the behavior box. And um, to your point, yes, people like to fill in the behavior box. You know, what is the what, should the behavior of the other party be taken into account? Mm -hmm. And uh, that is where you tend to get, you know, all kinds of casually used language uh, to do with you know, personality disorders, you know, control and emotional abuse, uh, you know, narcissism, etc. You're quite right there because you said backfired. It does tend to because the threshold in legal proceedings for behaviour is much higher than uh, would be the case if you were discussing with friends what should be taken into account. You know, people are, you know they do but they talk in the pubs. I, I get this sort of after yep. the weekend in the pub. People come in and say, oh, "I was talking to my uh, my friend, you know, and they said this, that, and the other." But the reality is when you're in court, the threshold for behavior is very high. And the leading cases on behavior tend to look at things like attempted murder. If that's the level we're looking at. It's often termed as a very yeah. high bar. Now, judges, therefore, don't really like um, behavior being casually argued. If it's below that threshold, then it's not relevant. If it's if you want to plead it, you have to you have to argue it at that point. But Fred, there is another 
category, which is more relevant, actually. So people do make a mistake there. And if they do, then it will backfire on them. But where it is relevant or more relevant is in sort of financial control. A lot of these personality disorders will have elements of control. And again, your, your listeners, anyone who's going through this, will, 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 or may be unfortunate enough to recognize it in their um, partner. But, you know, uh, they do have elements of control and, and the definitions of psychological and emotional abuse, which are, are broadly, uh, as you know, the same, uh, contain control elements uh, in, in most cases. So financial control um, or disadvantaging the other party through um, financial control is, is really common. So you might get financial misconduct, for instance, as opposed to uh, behavior in its broadest sense right like involving somebody spending too much or or preventing spending or uh preventing subsidizing the other party or making rash investments or you know all of those sort of things and um that's something which which of course can be pleaded and brought into account in a, you know in a broader sense interesting so that's basically used as a proxy for the toxic behavior because it has a real measurable impact as mm. opposed to a series of snarky comments or demeaning comments it is we can actually measure how much money was spent on what blown on what or withhold or withheld uh, yeah that's quite interesting okay yeah so, so what you'll notice from that is what the court are dealing with or prefer to deal with is measurables if you like so financial stuff is measurable and you know you can then assess it yeah the, the, where i think in my experience at least, where the psychological aspect of it comes in is more in case management and client management. You know, if you listen carefully you know, to, your, to your clients, then then you pick up actually where there is a potentially a serious problem with the other person's approach. And that's going to inform how you litigate. You know, I mean, for instance, if you had somebody who, who really did have uh, a diagnosis or a, a potential diagnosis of um, uh, narcissistic personality disorder, you know, as of DSM-5. Yes. In other words, that they scored five, at least five out of nine of the, the, the key points in the DSM. Then, of course, you'd be yourself mad to litigate in uh, in a friendly open <laughs> <laughs> to be realistic, don't you? Um, and then you do come across these people in the same way um, you, you know you, you come across them in life. You do come across them. I have to say, people with genuine um, uh, narcissistic personality disorder are, are, are pretty rare. And of course, I have to make a couple of points, which I uh, which I, I know uh, Freddie will be familiar with, and that's you, you cannot make a diagnosis of of, of that uh, of NPD without a, cl- a clinician. Because it's quite complicated. There is controversy about DSM, as you know. There's controversy even outside of DSM about whether narcissistic personality disorder is its own disorder or part of a cluster B personality disorder, which I think is, in my experience, more accurate. And you know, so I'm not a clinician, I'm a lawyer, but of course, where it comes into play is when you're assessing your other side, you're assessing your case, you can then look at sort of, you can listen to your client and hear what they say. And sometimes what you're hearing is just hurt. Mm-hmm. Sometimes there's more to it. You know, you can see that there's something going on. Yes. Um, but uh, yeah, so, so so that's the sort of a broader framework. So yes, we, as you would imagine, being frontline all face sort of merchants you know lawyers we do come across a lot of uh, very strange behaviors yeah i'd imagine and I, th- I think a key point there is indeed it's not about trying to put a diagnostic it's simply mm. see the patterns of behavior of the person before if systematically they're being unreasonable then maybe don't go into court assuming that this time for once they're going to be reasonable because it's it's not really a winning strategy uh, or seldom is and yeah. What what would be some common mistakes that you see people doing? So let's imagine you have a client mm. who, first of all, decides to see a lawyer, which is a wise idea, and to 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 find someone who understands this. So what would the what would be some of the natural impulses that would be a mistake? Or put differently, what would you change if you're dealing with somebody who seems to have a series of highly toxic traits? So without 
putting a diagnostic, just thinking there's a risk that this person isn't falling into the quote unquote normal category. Mm. What would be mistakes? What would we do differently? Yeah, there's a very, very common mistake, which is usually identified actually by um, your client. Uh, and, and that is, and this is something I, ca I can't tell you how often I've heard this, is one of the most common uh, tropes. And that is to say, for instance, my, you know, I, I am controlled, uh, you know, I, 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 the, my life is near impossible because of the restrictions, the, 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 the kind of denigration, the undermining, the silences, you know, all the usual traits. But they say in public, they are charming. Mm -hmm. And so the first mistake is to build your case as though that person is going to behave behind closed doors. They won't. They'll, when they meet their lawyer, they will be charming. When they're in court, they will be charming. They, You have to uh, appreciate that a lot of controlling relationships, the, the person who is in control or exercising the emotional abuse is very capable of being super charming in public. And for some reason, and I don't know the clinical basis for this, I, I, I know just touching on it that that it is a, 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 a feature sometimes of um, um, sort of cluster B type things that people can be very sort of gregarious, but charming is the word that comes up more than gregarious, that, that ability to appear quite self-deprecating sort of what's all this nonsense, you know, I don't understand what she's saying, you know, and, and, and coming across with a degree of largesse that uh, really confuses the other side and makes dialogue very, very different and difficult. So, uh, yeah, I think that is it's the complexity of people's behavior, which is which is different behind closed doors. So when you're expecting somebody to give evidence badly, they won't. They will be charming and they will mm -hmm. be you know, they will be very likable and judges will generally sort of like them, oftentimes more than your client who may struggle to give evidence after years mm -hmm. of being undermined and uh, and they come across sometimes if you're not careful your client can come across as suspicious or paranoid you know which is exactly one of the the kind of traits that is exploited in this situation. Yes. So what I would say in that uh, if you're faced with that is that you you look at the facts you stick with the facts the facts that will tell the story of your patient uh, the patterns of spending patterns of you know uh, behavior can be made out. It's one of the there are a lot of advantages, I think, to the current process, which has been streamlined. But one of the disadvantages is the restrictions for, for clients who feel that they've suffered from years of emotional abuse. One of the problems is it's very light on narrative evidence now, you know, okay. yeah. because the courts have, have got very limited time. Mm -hmm. they're Remote settlement, so they don't want to fan the flames as they would see it. But oftentimes, that can feel like an injustice from the point of view of the person who has, uh, you know, f or feels aggrieved coming out of the relationship. So, so yeah. th in that sense, it's quite, um, yeah, it's quite complicated. But so you, so you see it in that sense. That's quite a, you know, interesting as you as you point out. Just stick to the facts. I think it's one of the the most important things when people exit a relationship is on the one hand there's the the narrative that they were sold and usually one of the disconcerting parts is to see that the narrative sounds great and it doesn't match reality so we have to believe one of the two either the narrative or reality it can be tough to want to stick to the facts but it's mm. really when you know i observe time and time again when people are trying to ungaslight themselves one of the best exercises to do is simply to write down the facts write down timelines write down what was said and when, because there's always some, you know, some level of uh, of doubt that can creep in. So a person saying, you know, denying that they said something, or go, well, you have a recording, so yes, I did say, it, but it's not what I meant. And there's always a second, you know, level where they can retreat to to say you're just being paranoid, whereas the facts at one point speak for themselves. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely right. And you, 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 that that is one of the, the sort of narrative traps isn't it that the, the the more they try and make out their case the more they seem to appear paranoid as per the allegation made against them you know they sort of yes and it's really that's a difficult one to unpick because it's uh, it's difficult to stop um i think so, so so taking a step back from that i think the first thing 
uh, that's probably helpful is to look at the facts and try and depathologize, uh, if excuse me, that hor horrific um, uh, adjective, uh, the, 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 the narrative. So in other words, I think it can be really unhelpful. And this, there's another point you would, uh, I think, just mentioned um, earlier about children. The, the, you know, the, there is, uh, you know, a lot of families I deal with, most of them have children. And uh, in that situation, the use of language, the use of uh, how it's deployed becomes uh, really loaded, uh, critical even, because you could damage the children easily by misreading or backing a case that was based on hurt rather than facts. You know, you've got to be super careful. And I think one of the things there which really distresses me is where you do get um, people who, who propagate arguments based on undiagnosed but pathological terms um, as though they were fact. As I said, you know, with, with the... Um, uh, MPD, you have to have a, a clinical diagnosis. With most of these things, you require re reasonably a clinical diagnosis. So it's useful to be aware of them because people come, uh, you know, you see this all the time, people come in with with toxic relationships, which is a nicer definition, really, because that you can recognize <laughs> doesn't you know, require a clinical diagnosis, really. But they don't want that. They want to be subject to something which they can label um, and i think the irony there is that when you pathologize the behavior of your opponent you empower them and uh, you you actually lose your own agency because what you're saying is that you're accepting you're dealing with something that you cannot change that is bigger than you are and that loss of agency in the face of a definition I think continues the uh, abuse in the relationship in a way, and but that's an idol that you create for yourself by using the terms. So I think, um, in, in a way, de-escalating the narrative where it's appropriate to do so is quite empowering as well. Yeah, that's that's an interesting point where. I, I'm always sort of torn between the two. I think it's a, a matter of, of balance between the two, because on the one hand, trying to assess the situation with the thought of the other person's got some level of being reasonable, so I've got my level of responsibility. That's that's the way we normally deal with relationships. Mm -hmm. When we're dealing with toxic people, uh, and I dislike the, the term narcissist because it's misunderstood. So I prefer, you know, toxic people. We see one of the patterns they have is to say, a hundred percent of the blame is on your shoulders, and I've done nothing wrong. So mm. you're fully responsible for everything. And I find as soon as we're in that kind of dynamic, something does shift. So then it becomes helpful to think, I'm not dealing with someone who's being reasonable, and these are the clusters of behaviors that these unreasonable people have. And once we have that, then it's about regaining the balance towards our own agency. So it's a, it's sort of a, maybe a first step is to say, it's not 100% my responsibility. Open up the possibility to the other person having their responsibility and then claiming our part of responsibility without delegating everything to them. And I think this is where there's a, uh, after, how should I put it, a common misunderstanding. We're talking about people's responsibility can be, but well, some people claim it's victim blaming, which I don't think is helpful as a concept at all, because we always have more than 0% responsibility. Even if we were scammed and manipulated, it's still, it might be close to zero. Nonetheless, it's more than none whatsoever. And if we're able to focus on that which is under our control, we begin to regain agency and we stop demonizing the other person and we can start rebuilding and being, I'll oh, take more agency instead of delegating it to someone else. Yeah, I actually couldn't agree more uh, on that. Um, and the, the interesting thing about that is that it's sort of that that's that guidance comes usefully from someone in your position because it's very difficult to see it when you're on, you know, when you're when you're in the thick of it. But it's really good advice because um, it, it's the, it's the same point on that. You know how you I mean, if you go back 
uh, this is as I have rationalized it from myself over the years, is if you go back to the beginning of relationships or intimate personal relationships as they're categorized, they, um, there's something in, uh, implicit in the start of those relationships that opens you up to vulnerability and fear. There has to be a thrill factor or an attraction factor, which is somehow um, making you vulnerable or, or exposed. Uh, you know, a, a relationship with perfect boundaries and a cool temperament is actually a friendship. So in that early stages, there is something which has in it the DNA of trouble if it becomes ungovernable. And in that at that point, you already have responsibility. You, know, you already have responsibility. And, and one of the, the, the strange things about human nature is that we have so little perception of the, the, the kind of natural processes that govern our progress in relationships. You know, we don't, we, we, I think because we're brought up on a, sort of a scaffold of literature and art to believe in all kinds of, uh, you know, romantic notions, which, yeah, fine. I mean, I've, I've no problem with that. But, but you know, the, the studies that I've, I've read and seen sort of always have this sort of four-stage uh, process of euphoric when you when you've got the dopamine and then whatever the next stage is where you get the oxytocin and then you get stage three which is where you know essentially um you, you have a i think it's called a crisis stage or something but but you uh, essentially it, it it comes at about the seven year mark which often people i think is quite an interesting one because it, it, seven years always seems to pop up in analysis of however scientific it is it always seems to end at around seven years and of course, in in law, you see a lot of divorces at around that time, and you have the seven year itch. You know, there's something in yes. so you, you go through these sort of these dopamine, oxytocin, this sort of merging, this euphoric, all of these different stages, mm -hmm. and you you then sort of, in a way, uh, if you're lucky enough to make it to stage four, which is a sort of stress-free, you know, well-balanced, uh, you know, mutually supportive, loving relationship, you're, you're, in my view, in a minority, mm -hmm. actually, yes. rather depressingly. <laughs> um, and so you should, if, if you set as the context for uh, trying to rationalise uh, the best approach or how to view these things it's quite interesting to look at you know that is the beginning because that both parties have agency actually uh, and mm -hmm. a lack of agency and uh, everything kind of tumbles out of there in a bit of a mess in in terms of whether it works or doesn't work by which mm -hmm. time nature's done its job and there's usually a, a, a couple of children complicating everything and adding yeah absolutely a, a third dimension to problem solving so when it comes to uh, to to somebody realizing that they they've been in a relationship that was you know where it wasn't just misunderstandings a bit of struggle but they're actually dealing with someone who is unusually difficult to deal with systematically unusually difficult where there's some you know a, a casual reading of the DSM five or of different toxic traits of people raise a number of red flags and they realize that they themselves have the symptoms of having been uh, you know, verbally abused, let, let, let's put aside physically, but let's just, just say verbally abused, demeaned, and they decide to get out uh, and the children involved. What would be some recommendations that you would have for them? Yeah, I think the first thing I would say, which is, which is perhaps odd for a lawyer, is do, do, uh, the first your first protocol, okay, go and see a lawyer. You don't necessarily have to say you've seen one, just get your background information. You can usually get a free appointment, so you know, don't, don't fret about the cost. Most or a lot of lawyers offer you know, free consultations. Get your north and south sorted out in terms of timing, what you should and shouldn't do regarding assets, moving out, you know, all the, the classic things that you hear. But then after that, I would go into mediation, which was focused on the children. I would start with that. Now, the reason I'd okay. start with that is because mediation is a much more child-centered, family-centered, softer. It's a, it, it may not sate people's anger, but 
if they could overcome that and see the the longer term or the medium and longer term for both them and the, and their children and you know the, the the family as it will exist in some form after that the outcomes are much better in other words it's it's as well not to confuse that anger with resolution you know they're two totally different things uh so yes i think the first thing is i would consider mediation of of course you know, you might well say, and with the the, the subject matter that, I, that 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 you're something of an expert in, I, I, it's a valid point. Well, well, yes, but what if the relationship is really toxic? What if you're looking at uh, control in the worst case, not physical but emotional? You're looking at that, and you know, one sees that quite a bit. Well, then, in that situation, you're going to have to look to defend your lines in a much uh, more aggressive way, unfortunately, and. Uh, you're going to have to be child centric because the court requires it. Uh, the, there are two um, totally separate systems to deal with the children and the money. Okay, that's the first thing, quite rightly, too, and not dealt with in the same system. The children can have a relationship uh, ordinarily with both parties. Um, you know, after uh, the, the, the marriage or relationship is broken down, but it may need to be defined and it may need to be regulated and it may need to be strictly defined and regulated. There may need to be set times, patterns, there may need to be limitations on it. You know, I mean, I've dealt with cases where there are many limitations there and they can be as extreme as having to have a third party present or take place at a particular venue, could be locational restrictions on it, behavioural restrictions, you know, they're all kinds of restrictions that can apply to the children's contact with the parent but um, that needs to be resolved and you need distance and independence independence from somebody who's abusive is absolutely critical because they uh, a, a, a naturally uh, controlling person will seek to use finances to control long after the relationship is broken down because what you learn quite quickly, I think, is the relationship's got nothing to do with anything. This is all about control, you know, fear-based control. And it goes on and it can go on. I mean, it's depressing, I know, for, for some of your um, uh, listeners and viewers, but uh, the sad truth is some of these cases can go on for years. You know, my longest case, Fred, and this will shock you, it's 10 years. You know, I had a case that went on 10 years. I've had a case... Yeah. It went on for six years, seven years, you know, often two years. So these are long term things. So that's the other thing is, you know, have a realistic if you're, if you're going to be separating from somebody, get your own front door, get your independence. And then then you're set up for what might be quite a long process, but it's not going to damage you. Mm -hmm. you that's, that's so important. I, I know people I know some people who decided to walk away from a lot, a lot of basically huge losses because they figured the likelihood of getting anything is tiny. I've spent enough years doing this and I don't want to risk another five or 10 years fighting over something. So basically I, the money lost is, I view it as being the price of my, my mental well-being mm. of trying to, to reclaim my life, get the, get the life back under control. Yeah, and... I've come across that. It's, yeah, you're right. So you do get people to do that. And actually I've got I've quite a lot, I think it sounds weird, but I've got quite a lot of respect for that actually because... Mm. Although it's completely contrary to uh, to my work, uh, I, I think it's almost quite a noble thing where people just say, you know, uh, I I'm going to trade this money for my time and independence and you know so forth. Of course, it doesn't work very well if there are children, no, because because they'll they'll just switch one mechanism of control for another. That's true. But uh, if if there aren't, then yes, I agree, and that tends to happen early and late in relationships, which is where you see the kind of patterning of of, uh, of separation. And um, I think that when you're looking at older couples and younger couples, you, you, you're almost dealing with uh, two completely different types of case. There's so much. In what way? Well, I was, I was mulling this over actually before uh, before today, and I was thinking, well, uh, you know, how would you even begin to explain this? Well, I, I think there's a couple of things really. First of all, couples that are older, there's a generational difference, and you know, if you look at Gen Zers, for instance, they've got these situationships, 
which you know uh, where the categorization of of, uh, of 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 relationships and how they regard toxicity and everything like that is a million miles away from the way older people would regard their situation or what what constitutes a relationship for instance situationship i mean you know that's something that doesn't really have any uh purchase uh for an older person it just you know it's just wouldn't have any meaning to them um and i put myself in that category in a way i mean i struggle to understand some of the nuance required you know some of the sort of the the, the quantum physics that that uh the the, the gen Zers engage in when it comes to relationship uh spooky action at a distance it's very difficult to understand but um with older people of course you've also got the issue that they tend to have more um gender specific roles you know particularly with older older people mm-hmm. and older generations so they have space pace a space that they can retreat to you know like you, you married at 17 and buried at 70 sort of thing well that generation you, you might have had you know the grandfather would have a toolbox the grandmother a sewing box but there would be there would be a safe space uh gender space for them to retreat into in a, in a, a long and unhappy relationship that they, that they could find a space that was independent of the other person and the other person couldn't sensibly venture into that because it would be uh, mm. regarded as inappropriate Interesting. Of course, yeah. now we have a much more uh, fluid setup and that removes safe spaces psychologically places where you can retreat to and the other person can't come there because it would be gender inappropriate you know yes. now we can have that so there's so many different reasons, but but there was a study, I think this is uh, 2007 in Spain, where they looked at relationships of students, actually, I think, and it was 17 to 27, if I remember, and they, they categorized them. They were looking at, uh, they were trying to look at emotional abuse in sort of younger people and in those early first relationships. And what was quite interesting, they used the standard um, uh, psychological measures for what constituted an abusive relationship which is the uh the, the so-called conflict uh, tactics scale i think it's called or something like that you'd probably be familiar with it and what they found was that almost every single relationship could be classified as abusive <laughs> and um because young people find it difficult to govern their emotions mm. they find difficult to live they've only just started i mean they look at how they behave around the house you know i mean they're, yes. they, they, they're they're not in control of themselves yet they've got huge sort of uh, you know flows of hormones they've got limited experience they don't have the mechanisms and they behave badly and so in that period of 17 to 27 I was surprised actually Fred that it was 27 because I just thought actually it would have been a bit younger than that but nonetheless that was the mm-hmm. stuff and um I thought well that's really interesting that that should tell us something a lot of the academic studies actually d- d- talk in a language which is completely opposed to um what, what is perceived as uh, as acceptable or cultural norms they just describe a world which doesn't mm-hmm. seem to meet any um you know commonly uh, viewed uh, thing so uh, so th- that's the f- so so you've got that going on in those young relationships you you've, you've really got uh tremendous problems with boundaries and you know, not because they're evil controlling narcissistic but because they're young people who are really, really just messing up everything really badly. And I'm sure if most people were to look back at their first relationships, they would probably be less than proud of yeah. them. Yeah, so, uh, whereas obviously with, with old people, you, do, you just don't have that. Um, and then uh, I suppose the other thing you've got is this, uh, and this is perhaps not so much to do with age, but it's to do with uh, sort of, types of families um you've got uh, the sort of what what do you, do you know about um endo and exogenous family structures no i don't know about that all right so in the west sort of post-industrial you have really what's what, what's principally exogenous which is where the couple get together they break away from their family and they form okay. a new family mm-hmm. so uh and in in some 
some older cultures that would if, where, where they had exogenous behavior they would go to a different village they'd marry in a different village they would sort of they would go away uh endogenous is is where you kind of absorbed into the family and typically that would be sort of more of an eastern uh philosophy and so you've got these that you've got two different types of relationship as well as as everything else you you've got relationships where the the, the wider family play a big part and that can be useful it can be useful uh in terms of mediation problems are often solved uh which you know whereas where you have an isolated exogenous relationship there's nowhere to go friends quite often don't give the best advice let's come back to that um and uh so you've got that going on as well of course you know, it goes without saying that the um, endogenous relationships have tremendous drawbacks as well because they can be very suffocating. And in fact, what what I, what I describe as a sort of familial sport can, can equally be, and in many cases is, um, a very uh, repressive environment in, 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 you know, for some people. Um, so, you, you know, you've got so many different factors that, that apply generationally that when you're looking, I think, at relationships at the beginning and at the end, you can begin to see why I think that they're, you're looking at two totally different things. A bit like uh, yeah. Churchill said, uh, um, you know, American and English people being divided by a common language. Yes. And in, in a way, that's how I feel about young people and old people going through relationship breaks. Down. I mean, all, everything appears to be the same, but actually there's, there's, there's almost no commonality at all. Yeah. Um, I think there's also been a, a, a huge shift. I'm thinking about this, uh, about uh, sort of the expectations, but also, you know, obviously having divorce law to be able to to leave an unhealthy relationship is is something very useful. Mm. I see a number of people who found themselves in toxic relationships who basically felt that because they had the option of leaving, they didn't really vet the partner as rigidly as they would have if they were told, hmm. you're going to pick one partner for life, you're not going to mess around, you're not going to have casual flings or relationships that then sometimes they they feel trapped or ensnared in relationships. Mm -hmm. So you have to do this right, and you have to take time to court somebody who you actually picked yourself having developing a life with, and then there is no divorce option. So it's been interesting to observe how sort of the safety net might have contributed to develop uh, to allowing more of the toxic people to string together a number of relationships because of course it used to be they'd marry one person and ruin one person's life and now it's easier for them to 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 fling through multiple people sometimes or often at the same time and just cause more havoc than mm -hmm. than it used to be the case and it, yeah, there's been the commonality of people thinking, well, you know, in the worst of cases, we can always break up, which is much harder, obviously, after having a child. Mm. Uh, and quite often the question of, do I really picture this person as a good parent for my child? It's a question they said, well, if I'd asked myself the question, the answer would have been no, but I didn't think about it, or it was an accident, or uh the child was the result of a, a forced interaction that i didn't want or i got talked into it mm. um and that's a it, it's a strange thought to have because you know naturally well i've been raised i guess it's the case for you to think well having the choice is fantastic but then we see part of the the downside which is the the toxic elements seem to have more more influence than they used to yeah i mean i i, I yeah i think it's a re really really strong point uh, that uh, essentially, uh, what you're saying is that the the, the freedom or the, the uh, apparent freedom to enter into relationships and exit them um, informs uh, the, the, the a sort of a, a less rigid assessment of, of of whether that relationship is good. Yes, I think I think that's right. I mean, anything that that would occur to me if I was, if I was looking at that would be that uh, before. You know, if you go back a few years, uh, certainly, you know, I saw this when I was sort of starting out, so sort of thirty years ago. So the the relationships were often, you know, who was around. You know, uh, I, I mean, it yep. was the, the the selection was very limited uh, in, in, in in for a lot of people actually. You know, I mean, obviously there was the uh, the the 
social club, the club, whatever it was. But in reality, uh, choice was was relatively limited. If you can pair that to uh, the you know the ad dating apps and the availability of uh, you know finding a partner, I mean, it's incomparable. So, so the the, the selection uh, criteria may have been better, but the choice was more limited um, yes. in terms of availability. And and I wonder sometimes when I look at the figures, because obviously divorce rates are now fifty percent, um, and there's a, there's an unhappy kind of uh, analysis you can do. You can say, well, okay, fifty percent of people get divorced, but does that mean the other fifty percent are happy? Well, exactly. St- Statistically, that's unlikely. So you could say, well, perhaps half of those people are happy. And then you're down to 25%. And then you think, yeah, but there's two people in a relationship. Do I have that as well? You know, you can, it, the, 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 it doesn't bear scrutiny, really, mm-hmm. fortunately. But um, uh, I, I think being able to escape relationships very easily probably does. I think you're probably right. I think it, 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 it does affect how you go into them. Um, I, I would imagine, I mean, predates me, but I would imagine that uh, with that sort of fluidity in all things, it's not just relationship, it's contextual, isn't it? I mean, everything yep. is is uh, is is pitched, sold, represented as being fluid. Uh, and we have this strange paradox that over the top of that expectation, we have these sort of overarching uh, archetypes of romance, you know, the the, you know, which... Yeah, and the other thing I would say about that, just slightly digressing, it, that I notice as a, as a divorce lawyer, as a miserable um, sort of undertaker type profession, but what I notice is that the uh, archetypes, the relationship archetypes that you read about or you see in film, are usually pretty damaged. I mean, actually, you very rarely get a sort of uh, a, a kind of a, a, a sensible relationship with good boundaries um, in a movie. Or in a book, and and the, the classic sort of romantic heroes, certainly in terms of the male romantic heroes, you might think of sort of Heathcliff uh, in Wuthering Heights, or you know Darcy uh, has become quite a um, a trope nowadays. But they they were all flawed, mm-hmm. you. Know, and actually, if if they were sitting, if I was sitting in front of Kathy. If you're familiar with Wuthering Heights, I would probably be categorizing that as an absolutely abusive relationship. <laughs> it's funny. Yeah. It's, a, it's a good point. There, there are a lot of relationships in media that, that seem to be, you know, nice, and romantic and cute. Yeah. Uh, I remember there was some, someone who was talking about even Romeo and Juliet and saying, that's not romance. That's a warning to what levels of insanity people can stoop to when emotions take over. And you know, they, they fit very neatly into the Spanish study, actually. Uh, only yes. they, they, it wasn't uh, 17 to 27 or 18 to 27. I think they were 14 or 15. Right there was something like that. Yes. About, you know, a bunch of teenagers killing themselves because of communication problems and things that yeah. could have been overcome. And uh, do you remember the TV show Coupling that was on, on the BBC? about 20 years ago. Uh, okay. What happened? So that was, uh, it was uh, like a mix between uh, Friends and Sex in the City, but British style. Okay. And I remember watching it back then thinking it was hilarious. And now when I look at it, it's full of manipulative, conniving, unhealthy dynamics where a woman tricks her partner to get pregnant. Uh, so actually the, the, the funny, no, it's meant to be a funny scene. Uh, she, she she tells one of her friends that they're trying to get pregnant, and they go, so how did the, the 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 conversation go about having a baby? And we see the partner Steve who walks by in the corridor saying, "By the way, Susan, shouldn't we be doing something about contraception?" And she goes, "Don't worry about it." And so that's the baby conversation. So yeah. back then I thought it was hilarious, and now it really creeps me out. It's crazy. Well, it, it, that that's true. In fact, I, um, only yesterday uh, I was on the treadmill in David Lloyd and. Uh, for want of anything better to do, was was watching what I think was one of the James Bonds with Roger Moore. And, uh, of course, my life is totally relationship-centric after so many years. And I was sort of looking at the... I could not believe what I was seeing. I remember watching those as a a kid, just thinking, oh, that's normal. And then it's just horrific, you know, by today's standards. Mm -hmm. But on a kind of um, serious point, I mean... you can see one of the difficulties is that s- cultural norms are shifting so fast that time will make 
you know, as fools of us all, really, because by, by the time we get to, to sort of my age, uh, you know, I, I talk about situationships in Gem Z and, you know, the, the social media conversations that take place about them. And, uh, you know, I'm totally out of touch, you know. Yes. With, so I, I mean, I uh, I read my, um, my studies and, uh, you know, I, I know how the courts work and all the rest of it, but there's becoming an increasing mismatch between the 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 law as is practiced and administered and the way that it fits people and lives and and interestingly you see that you see there's there's always been a lag obviously as there should be between sort of cultural norms and the formation of laws because that 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 you know one needs to reflect on the change decide whether it's good or bad and then legislate for to contain it or to to restrict it or to encourage it whatever it might be yes but uh, in the area of family law you see this in um things like surrogacy you know where some which is i i I do uh i have a a practice in surrogacy and ai which is artificial insemination rather than anything more academic Mm -hmm. and um that you you see how the law commission is uh is you know, trying to work out what the parameters of surrogacy should be. And meanwhile, you know, uh, people are, particularly with AI, they're just going on to Amazon, sorting it out for themselves. And the, the, the law is still struggling to work out how it, what it thinks about the, these issues, you know, and then because it's struggling with big sort of cultural conversations like, you uh, you know, um, the handmaid's tale, you know, should a woman's body be for sale in terms of the production of the baby for two other people? You know, what are the ethics of that? Or what are the uh, what are the commercial ethics of having, you know, uh, an arrangement like that, irrespective of that? What are the religious connotations? And you've got this divide um, in, in, in uh, Europe. Uh, often you see it between the Southern uh, Catholic, more, more sort of... Um, uh, Orthodox Catholic countries who who object on the basis that it's quite clearly something that, that that doesn't fit in with the scriptures and the sanctity of birth and marriage and so forth, and then the northern countries uh, who who object on the basis of the Handmaid's Tale type arguments that it's uh, it's exploitative. You know, you can't use womb for rent. You know. Um, and so the law is lagging behind, and yet we have an aging population. We have a need for surrogacy, and we have all of that happening. But the law. In you know, families, this area is evolving so quickly that oftentimes the law is just left for dust in terms of where it, where it should be, how it should be operating. I think it's, that's a key point also is for people to realize that often they don't understand how the law functions. And the law is created by people who are doing their best, often with a lag. And if they walk in expecting some universal divine justice, they're likely to be disappointed. They're likely to have the wrong strategy. And I, I know a key point is often the uh, the question of validation. I know people often seek validation and they it's often the, the, the question of justice. If the if the court rules that I was wronged, then at least I feel validated. And I understand the psychological impulse to try to feel that a, a wrong has been righted or at least acknowledged. And I often observe that that's a, a suboptimal strategy. And it's mm. not realistic to get this. It can backfire. And instead, it's often a, a matter of thinking of the various possible outcomes that are realistic. How do I maximize the chances to get the best outcome, uh, be it for oneself of children are involved, especially for the children. And this is uh, it's actually something you mentioned before when when the children are involved to try to get into the um, uh, the mediation, keep it child centric. How do you view it, by the way, when you're dealing with a toxic person who will seek to weaponize the child and is happy to mm-hmm. harm the child to get back at the partner? Uh, I had the, the the case, by the way, with one person who was who didn't understand why the partner wasn't being child centric. And my reading of this was something like, your your former partner believes that they're basically your one in a million person. In other words, they're in the top 6,000 human beings alive. So if you, 6,000 or 8,000. So if you take it by men, we're in the top 3,000 or 4,000. So it's not possible that you left them. Therefore, they want to get back at you and they're willing to use the child against you to get back at you. And she, of course, didn't understand, thinking it's 
why isn't the child a priority? But of course, if the child isn't a priority, then that can be weaponized. So what are your thoughts on, on that? Yeah, it's a, that's the, you, yeah, you do see that. Um, okay, well, I think uh, that... The, First of all, mediation does not fit that uh, scenario, in my opinion. In my opinion, um, in all probability, it would probably get screened, or you'd have to advise your client to consider uh, a more orthodox uh, approach through the courts. Because uh, if if a parent cannot, through or for whatever reason, adequately meet the child's needs and that's the category i put that in i think that is uh abusive actually when a parent uses a child uh, uh weaponizes uh the the children issues as, as you put it then i think that is a that is a that is a high bar already and actually i would screen that for any form of um personally i know others wouldn't agree with me but i would screen that from alternative dispute resolution uh, in the main um, I think you've got to be in that situation. You've got to be the person who protects the child. You've got to be that person. And you've got to say, what do you think is necessary to uh, put a protective uh, barrier around the, the harm that could be otherwise caused to the child? Is that restrictions on contact? It's really common for people who have genuine personality disorders to fail to recognize the separate needs of a child or children. Um, and when you see that, that, that you have to act uh, quickly. The courts are not very good at it. They're not very good at it because uh, the person that's doing that will not say they're doing that. They will say something else. They will build their best case. They will say that it's possibly your client who's doing that, that they're trying to stop them seeing the child or they're trying to, you know, they will have uh, opposing arguments and court time is short. And the court process is flawed, and uh, particularly so with children matters. So if there is a risk to harm to a child, then you have to be, and you are the parent with care, then you have to really exercise your, your, your control. Yes, of course, you have to be sensible, you have to be circumspect, but if that is your view and you think that is happening, then you have to protect the child. And the way you do that in most cases is to restrict the, f the, the method, frequency, uh, nature of, of the contact. Now, it may be that, that what that will do is it will result in, in many cases with a report being done uh, on by sort of CAFCAS or someone uh, like that you know, with qualifications to look at the issues from a child-centered point of view to analyze both parties, to consider what the risks are. In the very worst cases, and I would say this is, you know, I don't want to um, overstate this case. In the very, very worst cases, you know, sometimes you will get uh, highly restricted or even sometimes very rarely no contact. But it is through the regime of contact that, that, can, that that's the only way it can be addressed. You can't reason your way out with somebody who's got a, uh, a let's go back to the term we used earlier, pathological personality disorder entrenched. Uh, who is going to use uh, any means possible to protect themselves from being uh, denigrated, hurt, left. Um, you know, they're, they're not capable of, of uh, respecting the parent-child boundary. And you know, that's what you have to do. So how, how would that work? I'm just thinking of uh, a couple where one person is you know, neglecting, weaponizing the child. Uh, so the toxic person would be restricting access where normally the child spends time with each other and they have time to, to make calls with the other parent, you know, based on, on goodwill. And the person says, you're not going to have that anymore. So they are doing the restricting. The court says you have to share custody between the two because there's nothing substantial enough to make us say we will reduce the custody with a person who is who's claimed to be toxic. Uh, so aside from just documenting the evidence, because then if you restrict access, then you are the one going against the court's orders. So how how would that work? Well, yeah, okay, that's that that's important. So the first thing is the order will come at the end, the, the end of the process, the end of the inquiry, the 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 end of the um, uh, the the report that I was talking about. The, the, you you have to. There are a couple of tips I would say to people. One thing I would always say is keep a diary. Keep a contact diary, you know, not, not to be like Anne Frank or something. Yeah, just a diary of times. What you what they'll often describe is a parent who is actually quite remote, unreliable. 
So there's, there's again, this sort of conflict between the case that they make out and their actual behaviour towards the child. It's sort of, it, it is an inevitable consequence of people that really have a total lack of empathy that they will change their mind at the last minute and not turn up. So keep a contact diary because that type of um, granular evidence is impossible to re- rep- replicate after the event. So the first thing I say is the moment you think this is happening or could happen, start keeping a diary. That's your evidence. Mm-hmm. Um, the second thing, obviously, is that you're not going to do this whimsically. You're, people only take this course of action as a last resort. So the evidence will be there. You know, I mean, they, 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 this won't be a kind of, well, I think this is going to happen because it, I think this is going to happen. You wouldn't cut it. It's not going to work. There has to be evidence of it. There has to be evidence uh, in the relationship, evidence, you know, or in terms of the, the contact regime and how, how it's worked. And that, again, comes back to my diary point. You map the evidence. It comes down to fact. It won't come. You cannot casually in court proceedings expect to turn up and through sheer you know, rhetorical skill persuade a judge of a particular outcome. It's down to the facts. They're not going to take a chance. So if you have the facts to support it, if you have the evidence to support it, uh, then you have the conviction. And the conviction is you're going to stand by your your view that this child is being harmed. Yes. And, uh, so it, it's not easy for people to do. And it, and if I can put it in this way, the, the best parents, the, the, the kind of the, the kindest and, and most empathetic parents find it the most difficult to do you know so there's the there there again yet another paradox yes uh, that's a good point i think the, the the boiling down to what the facts are it's trying to remember the goal is not to persuade the court and the judge it's to to basically be witness to uh, to give the facts and and the more objective someone comes across or, or rather the least subjective someone comes across just staying factual uh the the more con- the more credible they are there's um are you familiar with the the six thinking hats method by uh, uh what's it edward de bono so he's got this this method i like to use it because i think it is quite quite yeah. um illustrative which is to say we've got six different ways of thinking and often we have misunderstandings because people are wear, are using different ways of thinking at the same time. So imagine you've got six hats with different colors, and every time you put a hat on, you'll think a specific way. So the white hat is when you're looking at facts. You just think of a white sheet of paper, and you write down what the facts are. The red hat is the emotions. So think anger, emotions. That's how you're feeling about things. The black hat is everything negative. You think of a dark sky, cloudy sky. Uh, you know, what could go wrong? What's the downside? The yellow hat, think bright sun shining, is yeah. everything could go right. It's the positive side. It's the the pros. Then you've got the, the green hat, think nature that's growing. That's the creative side. What could we do differently? And then the blue hat is the process. Think of a, a river flowing slowly. So how do we get things done? And I find that that often people need to express the emotions and get them out of the system. And once that's out, anytime there's anything in a court, it is stick to the white hat thinking. Uh, of course, what happens when when people have disagreements is they'll be wearing different hats. So if you wear the, the black hat and I wear the yellow hat, you'll look at the downside and I'll be looking at the upside. So we'll be fighting over that. But if we both wore the black hat, we'd probably agree. And then if we both wore the yellow hat, we'd probably agree. And yeah. I think to to remember that the goal isn't to convince the the court of the the downside of the relationship or the black hat with the other person's behavior to simply say these are the facts. I'll let you come to your conclusion, and I'm not going to try to sway you. I'll just try to be descriptive. And the more we do that, the more credible we become. But it also means being able to process things beforehand in order to simply stick to the facts and mm-hmm. sort of trust the system. Yeah, that's, that's really good advice. I mean, it, it's um, and you're right because the the, the mistake on had a, a trial recently, and what 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 I always say to my clients is, you know, try to imagine, try to imagine it from the judge's point of view. What they're looking for is they're looking for not to be persuaded, but they're looking for reliable evidence. They're looking for something they can they can really bank because they don't want to make a wrong decision. 
you know, it weighs on their conscience as well. They, so they look, for, they look both in the demeanor and the substance of evidence for reliability. So they don't want histrionics. They don't want anger. They certainly don't want sarcasm or, you know, making points. It's natural for people because obviously we have a very silly adversarial system in the family courts, which is mm-hmm. doesn't this at all, does it? You know, cross-examining a sort of husband or wife yes. after 30 years of marriage is ludicrous. But nonetheless, that's the system we have. So, you know, you 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 can really win in terms of your evidence by by, as you say, just being analytical, by being factual, being sort of kind, empathetic in your delivery, but not trying to persuade, just give the facts, have faith in your case and uh, and be the person, um, you know, that the, the judge is going to want to hear from. Um, and uh, I think uh, that, that is so important. I mean, actually it's important, obviously, in oral evidence, which is where it all ends up if everything else fails. But um, it's also important in terms of where you give evidence. And one of the tips, going back to your kind of tips on, on, on divorce, is this is something that, that you very rarely hear said, but I, I believe it to be true. And that is most relatively competent lawyers can tell you, you know, an approach which is likely to be the, you know, they, can, they can't tell you the outcome of your case, in terms of your finances, but they can give you a very good idea of the roadmap and the orientation and what it's going to look like. And um, so what, what, what I think is that you should look at uh, marginal gains within the categories. Don't look at trying to win big because it's going to end in huge costs and the lawyers will be the winners, as, as people say. Yes. So look at marginal gains. Look at where you can actually make a difference. Look at things like housing needs, income needs. Do your job properly and set the and, and do the hard yards, the unglamorous evidential gathering. Do that properly. Understand how cases are put together, and then just try and keep costs because costs are a sort of an, a negative gain if you can keep them low. You know, they they costs can get very very high indeed. Um, now you can't always do that. You get cases where. Uh, you get complicated cases where the disclosure is a nightmare. You also get bad actors, if you put it like that, people who don't want to disclose everything, people who've got offshore assets, trust assets, you know, and for them it's a game. But for most people, most of the time, you can get a good outcome by just taking, you know, t- taking your time, doing the, the hard jobs, which you can do yourself. Most of that stuff actually can be done with a bit of advice and uh, understanding and then just go away and gather us and have someone curate it for you for the purpose of your case but that you know it's not expensive to do it that way yes i think i think, I think go on, yeah sorry. That, that, that that makes that makes a lot of sense and i think you know you're you're reminding me of something which is when people go into these situations i think it's helpful to consider a few factors one is what you know what is a realistic outcome that they can get what is good enough where they can walk away without too much disappointment. And then what is the the minimum they should be able to get? And if they're able to triangulate between the minimum outcome that seems realistic and then something that's good enough for them to be okay with, and then what's realistic, it can help them avoid thinking they want to get 100% of everything that is possible because at one point it just becomes less plausible and it might even hurt the case where it looks like they're they're, they're, well, they're being unreasonable. Like they want absolutely everything, uh, and sometimes you know it's just a matter of they want revenge rather than uh, actually. That's the yeah. point. Yeah, they, they're looking for revenge rather than simply to close a miserable chapter of their life with the least pain possible and move forward with the smallest scar possible. Mm, I know. Well, that's right. And uh, and actually, also don't try as you put it. Don't try and win big because you know you set up resentments. Uh, that you know, divorced families are not, uh, you know, are not put it back in the position of when of before the parties got together. They are a new shape, a new for, a new entity, and you know, there will be children in most cases. Don't create a huge discrepancy, even if you were able to, because it will come back and bite you. Um, because the children will will see the injustice, and you you know, it leaves a footprint. That's true. And there's a, there's a risk that the other parent talks about the injustice, the children take side, 
and mm. uh, and especially if objectively someone really fleeces the other partner, uh, regardless of what happened, it's easy. And I've seen that sometimes the children start taking a side with a toxic partner, and the other person doesn't understand why. So it's important yes. to have a long term strategy, which ought to be for the children's benefit, even if it hurts us, mm. uh, you know, individually in the short term, that the children get well as as little harm as possible. Yeah, uh, absolutely right. So, there's, so the the parameters of a good outcome are very different from what's uh, from the outcome that somebody might aim for with unfettered ambition. You know, it, it, as you say, you you should be aiming at about the sort of sixty percent mark if you want a good outcome, fifty five, sixty percent mark, not uh, eighty or ninety percent, because it just won't work. Yes, and we'll come back and bite you. So, I mean, there's there's things like that. Um, so there's, there's there's quite a bit in there, but things have improved. And I will just quickly, uh, for amusement only, just a bit of light relief, tell you about how they used to do things in uh, 14th century Germany. Yeah, please. Well, <laughs> well this is one that I it's been quite amusing, actually. I don't know why, it's horrible. But um, there, there was, I think it was, a, it was a professor at Oklahoma University came across these 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 papers which included a description i'm pretty sure it was where germany is now um of the way they used to sort out marital disputes and they had decided that the way to do it was to put the husband in a hole with one arm tied behind his back and give him a stick whereas the wife um had I think I remember what her, I think she was given five rocks of various different sizes, one of which was covered in cloth for some bizarre reason. And um it was kind of winner takes all, really. Uh so they would the husband was not allowed to touch the side. Um, or and if he did, then he had his stick taken away, I think, which was a pretty hopeless position for him. Um and meanwhile, if I think if the wife attacked the husband uh, outside of the rules, then she lost one of her stones. So, so we've moved. A little way from that um but sometimes i think we haven't moved very far during <laughs> <in terms. laughs> i think sometimes you look at it you think well, how far have we actually moved? and i think that goes back to my point brett that the system we have and coming from lawyer this is probably not a great thing for me to say but the system we have really doesn't work very well in my opinion it's just not the right system for i mean you may say well it's the better the, the least worst but an adversarial system for family courts mm. seriously i mean does it even sound right nowadays no and it sort of it sort of implies we're dealing with two good faith actors who yes. are you know able to be somewhat reasonable and are not pathological liars and are mm. not being massively dishonest all the time so in, in in these situations, I think we need to be aware of the limitations of the court, limitation of the system, the fact that society is only slowly catching up with the advances in psychology. The pop psychology and pop culture isn't helping because now, uh, like you mentioned uh, at first, a lot of people throw around semi, you know, they're claiming to be diagnostics, but often it's just because they're angry at a person. So it becomes a, an ad hominem attack as opposed to a di you know, uh, as opposed to diagnostic. Now we even saw with the, uh, the Johnny Depp Amber Heard trial last year, a number of people completely siding with her to start with. And then the evidence started mounting that she wasn't being entirely truthful to say the least. Uh, some people switched their opinion. Some people just said it's too complicated, but you know, for the first time we had, uh, a very public display of how complex it can be and how, you know, we know that narcissists will use a lot of projection and it can be very unsettling to hear the cases of one person accusing the other one of being abusive or one person accusing the other one of, of uh, what is it, enabling parental alienation when mm. actually it's them doing it. So I think it's also important to recognize it's tough to be judges. It's tough to be in court. It's tough to manage this. These are humans doing their best, and they're not psychologists. And uh, if we're stuck with a system that's flawed but better than nothing, then it's about being strategic about it. Well, yeah, and it's, of course, that's right. It is a limited resource. If you look at uh, your um, Amber Heard um, uh, example, they had had the case in London beforehand, hadn't they? They had sort of a, a, a pre-run, prequel, if you like, which, of course, uh, Johnny Depp had lost. 
He then went to America. But what was different about the American case, in my opinion, was the amount of time that was given to us to air the evidence. So yes. what we had, and I, I might have this wrong, but I think I think the case in London was a, was a matter of days uh, compared with... I think so. With the, with the, and so the once the evidence is aired, then you're right. All of these things started to come out, and um, we don't have the time. Judges are you know, usually list for uh, you know, sort of our average case might be listed for three days. It's never three days. The first half a day is reading. You then have your opening speeches. Day two might be um, you know, cross examination. You know, it might be a couple of experts in there somewhere and then day three is pretty much uh time for the judge to write his closing says so they're tight you know there, there's not much time and people after you know a number of years of marriage want to if they're going to make out cases which are very nuanced about control need days or weeks you know not an hour in the witness box it's not going to work particularly when they have to make out important aspects of their evidence to do with housing needs, income needs, and stuff like that. So it, it just doesn't happen. It's not a place for comprehensive justice in that sense. It is a, a way of resolving, you know, the family courts, the ancillary relief courts are a way of resolving financial disputes, ancillary to divorce. They're, 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 they've really got very little scope over and above that. I think and, that's, go, go ahead. No, and I was going to say, just picking up on your other point about that, the 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 the, the research papers that I've read on psychological abuse uh, just reveal the, the level of complexity in trying to to work out who's responsible, you know, for different types of aggression, uh, both in terms of um, uh, normative heterosexual, uh, but also. Uh, other relationships, uh, and they they usually find it's bi-directional, as they call it. You know that, that actually there's very little evidence in terms of psychological aggression that you can name a particular category of person. It doesn't seem to work like that. Yes, it translates into aggression differently across different um, protagonists, but actually emotional abuse, emotional um, psychological abuse is 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 kind of even Stephen across the categories as I understand the research papers that I've read um so it's it's tricky you know it's very very tricky and to even try and delve into that for a judge who's just trying to work out you know whether somebody should have a housing fund of five or six hundred thousand I mean they're just not interested yeah that makes that makes a lot of sense and I think the trying to fit people into categories creates blind spots which makes more people vulnerable it's seldom that simplistic. We can look for patterns across categories, if helpful, but always compare that to reality. And and we're dealing with individuals. So any any situation will be showing us exactly, like you said before, the symptoms, the patterns, the behaviors. That's where the diary is so helpful. And mm. and maybe maybe having some ideas will highlight patterns that we wouldn't have seen or behaviors that we would have dismissed, maybe. And we should always bring it back down to what the facts are and the the, the specific uh, specific cases. Um, and I think that you know a key point that you mentioned just now is that the court is not a place for getting closure. It's a mm -hmm. case for for sorting things out from a legal point of view. But closure, well, typically comes from inside uh, with therapy work. And the more I've seen, the more someone has done the internal work beforehand, the better equipped they are to deal in a, in a strategic and uh, rational manner with the court system. Uh, mm -hmm. But there's a lot of work to be done beforehand. And mm -hmm. it helps, yeah, just uh, just deal with the, with mm -hmm. the emotions. That's really interesting. We're putting it that actually courts don't give you closure. I hadn't thought of it in those terms, but that's right, isn't it? They're doing. I mean, they they resolve one aspect of, of the relationship. That's where my involvement ends generally. So perhaps I... I haven't seen that clearly enough, but you're right. Yes, they don't, and they shouldn't. They shouldn't be uh, regarded as trying to. I suppose that's perhaps the mistake. And the other point, going back, uh, is the the kind of prejudice point in terms of patterning and stuff, which you know does exist. Um, the the issue with that is that you don't know who you have in front of you. You know, it is a scatter graph in reality. And you will get outliers. And uh, until you have a surefire way of knowing 
who the individual you're sitting in front of is and where they fit, you cannot, you have to essentially put every other notion you have about how things fit together to one side because people really are so different across all different categories that you you just that you don't know who you're sitting in front of no that's a very good point uh and it, it can be strange when we've been in a relationship with someone we thought we knew the person then it turns out that we missed a lot of things or we misled or the person might seem like a like a stranger when we actually put two and two together we uncover a hidden life or, or a series of lies that we that we believed that can be very disconcerting and mm-hmm. uh so and the, this would be my, my last question because i kept you for a long time uh mm-hmm. what would be a, a piece of advice you'd give to someone who um let's see who, who phoned you up he basically said listen i've i'm going to separate from my partner i've realized the number of um patterns that i hadn't come across before I don't know if there's a, a diagnostic or not. I just realize this is not a good faith actor. Uh, where do I start? What would you say? I think I would say um, don't, don't, you know, don't you don't have to rush anything. Take some advice and say you can usually do that for free. Um, sometimes at that initial advice, you'll go through everything and you'll say to the person, well, you know, have you considered having uh, or, or thinking about counseling? Because sometimes with the, uh, if people have been in a long-term relationship, which is toxic, they they have developed certain patterns themselves which are going to disadvantage them in any process including this one um and yes. those quite often are non-combative or peacemaking roles um which is a really bad place to start litigation from you know i've, I've already said it's, it's it's a silly system adversarial but it's particularly silly if you've been on the wrong end of an abusive relationship because you're likely to concede too many points too quickly so don't hurry take it take take your initial advice and uh and if it, if it would be helpful think about getting uh counseling or therapy or there's all kinds of things online um which you can you can look at resources to understand your position understand yourself understand what it's like to be uh, in your position so educate yourself but don't rush in you, know, you don't have to rush into you can rush into leaving the relationship but what comes after that you know sometimes it's very difficult i think for all of us to recognize the people we have become and our own limitations shaped by whatever forces they, they may be in relationship or otherwise. And it's funny, isn't it? People often describe what they go on hold or they go traveling and they come back totally different people. And really all they're describing is they're describing themselves reinflating into the person they actually are, you know, untrammeled by the pressures of life and so forth. So think about that and think about, you know, remembering who you are and what you like and what makes you happy just simple things really yeah that's i think that that's excellent advice uh get yourself back on your own feet Mm -hmm. uh sort of ungaslight yourself and like you say there are a lot of um a lot of toxicity that people carry inside after toxic relationship can be thought structures behaviors assumptions frustrations and the less burdened they are walking into court the more likely they are to have a good outcome for themselves and for their children Uh, i think it's something also to consider is our ego can tell us that we should be able to get through things on our own and it, it might be the case but i liken it to trying to climb mount everest barefoot as you can maybe make it to the top but you don't win any brownie points and nobody thinks it's a smart idea just make things even more difficult than necessary so getting the right support uh, legally, of course, is key, where the licensed therapist is also key, who understands toxic relationships and narcissists, then uh, then coaches such as myself might be able to offer some frameworks that are a bit different. Uh, but the I think to, to believe that one can substitute another is not helpful. Lawyers will be able to give the legal advice, therapists will be able to, to work with the healing, and then coaches can provide something uh, a bit different that's complementary yes. but doing it on our own is we don't win brandy points we just make it harder for ourselves and the people who ri- the risk paying the price are the children so that's important to remember yeah i agree and actually there is a, a huge quantity of, uh, difference between the result you'll get if you go through if you try to climb everest barefoot and if you don't you know it's <laughs> as well as anything else so, <laughs> I, I think it's w- worthwhile i agree with you absolutely well, thank you very much, Henry. And where can people find you online? Oh, um, uh, Crisp & Co. Uh, Solicitors. Crisp & Co. Solicitors um, is, is the firm. And I'm Henry Crisp, hcrisp at crisp&co.com. Any questions, I'm always happy to uh, to answer.
Thank you. And I saw that you have a very interesting blog on your website. I think some very some valuable articles there that I recommend people have a look at. Thank you very much, Fred. And it's been an absolute pleasure. Yeah, thank you. So everyone, thank you for watching. Thank you for watching until the end. If you enjoyed this, let us know. If you have any questions, let us know. And if you'd like to have Henry back on the channel, either for a recorded video like this or for a live stream, then do let us know. Maybe I can persuade Henry to joining us again. So thank you. Thank you, Henry. Thank you, everyone, for thank watching. Thank you very much. You take care. Bye-bye. Likewise. Bye.